Hello and welcome to the Vedic Conversation. In this episode, we're talking with Tim Mitchell, a leading Vedic meditation teacher based near Melbourne, Australia. With a lifelong spirit of adventure, a passion for the ocean and sailing, a generous heart and thirst for knowledge, Tim has a deeply rich experience of life. Tim's been a meditator for many decades and travels the world as a teacher of the Vedic sciences of meditation, yoga and Ayurveda. He's also been a presenter at international conferences on Ayurveda in India and Australia. Today, he talks about life as experience, the fundamentals of Ayurveda and how to get a free meal in Prague. I'm Anthony Thompson, a Vedic meditation teacher based in London, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues Derek Yanford in New York and Rory Kinsella in Sydney. Sit back and let's dive into this fascinating and wide-ranging conversation. <laughs> yeah. So welcome, Tim. Welcome to the Vedic Conversation. Um, we're so pleased to have you with us today. Um, you and I met, I think, on a retreat in the UK when you were a chef. You were the, the chef. And that was my first proper introduction to Ayurvedic food. Um, and I think I had four consecutive days of an Ayurvedic diet, and it was a revelation. Mm -hmm. And as you know, um, I was so keen that I then took a private cookery lesson with you. And um, this is one of your many talents. You are a very talented uh, Vedic man. Uh, because, of course, you have studied a lot of the Vedic sciences and you've been involved with Vedic meditation since you were 18 years old, I understand. Ah, good memory. Well, done. well um, now, just to start from the beginning, you were initiated into the Transcendental Meditation Organization, just like I was. And that was what, in 72? Yes. Yeah. And then you met Tom Knowles... Um, some year, I think in 1989. 1989. Oh, you've got a very good memory of and, good research or something. It's, it's not memory, it's research. <laughs> 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 um, and so you're one of the one of the few people in the Vedic community. Um, I suppose I could count myself as one of those people too, who transition from transcendental meditation into Vedic meditation. Yeah. And um, You've obviously spent a great more time in the Vedic meditation world than you did in the, in the TM world. And do, do you find um, that today the demand for Vedic meditation uh, is pretty consistent? Or have you seen recently with the, uh, the, the pandemic and the virus situation that the demand for meditation has increased? Certainly, uh, the, the interest... Well, you know, over the decades, of course, it's changed a lot. You know, when I learned, if you said meditation, people thought you said medication, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, during the pandemic, has it changed the demand? Uh, I, I think certainly people are a, a, a lot more open. I live in a little village by the sea, you know, an hour and a half outside of Melbourne. Uh, and it's been a blessing for me to actually, the pandemic's just been a blessing of a quiet life. Um, so, you know, and all of the demands because of the restriction of movements have all just been local. So, uh, you know, and this thing between transcendental meditation and uh, Vedic meditation I mean, it's, it's a long conversation perhaps, but, you know, the short conversation, at least from our point of view as Vedic meditators, is there's no difference. There's no transition. There's no, uh, there's no problem. <laughs> uh, so to me, from our point of view and from my point of view, uh, they're synonymous, you know, because their roots are the same. Uh, and so I, I see no difference in that. But in meditation itself, the interest and the understanding for the public has certainly increased. 
you know, that's for sure. But, of course, with anything that becomes popular, you know, this uh, the name meditation now covers a whole range of activities which, from our point of view as initiators, are, uh, are not necessarily meditation. That's the change I see, yeah. Hmm. And do you see um, mindfulness as being a helpful uh, technique uh, in the sense that it helps a lot of people, but also it makes people aware that there's something even more than mindfulness and it drives them perhaps towards Vedic meditation? Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, especially over the last 12 months, or you now a couple of years, I guess, I've become more relaxed uh, in my... Well, that's not the word. I'm pretty relaxed in most uh, points of view, but more more open and accepting and less of a purist uh, in my attitude to what is out there in the marketplace, if we want to call it that. That's for sure, because I was a purist. And, you know, and when I first, especially when I had the first days of meeting Tom Knowles, and I say the first days, the first decade, um, you know, he was still a part of the Transcendental Meditation Movement then, um, and uh, I'd been, I'd known how to meditate for 15 years or something like that. I'd used a, what I'd now call a crisis management technique <laughs> um, in that I did it, you know, when I felt bad and I forgot about it when I felt good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Tom convinced me, you know, made me realise that what I thought was a tin cup was a golden goblet, you know. I, I learnt it from, you know, Mrs Mab's honey, as you pointed out, in 1972. It worked, it was nice, uh, and I never thought much about it. I was 18. I was pursuing lots of different things. Then, you know, as I got interested more and more in spirituality, uh I started to read about meditation. Everything they said was, it's really hard. And I went, oh, it's really easy. <laughs> I must have learned kindergarten meditation. So I started to go to some Buddhist things and what they taught was really hard. They were right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, being basically lazy by nature, I just keep on going back to what I learned, TM, to Mrs. Mabs Honey, and it worked. <laughs> but I kind of assumed, you know, and then my passion for boats in the ocean increased over that 15 years. And, you know, as I said, you know, I did it now and then, but it became more and more rare uh, for a period of time until I ended up in Sydney. I met Tom and he made me realise I'd learnt the PhD version. Um, and I started to get really involved in the whole thing, and I was a fanatic, you know, as we often are when we find something that is good. <laughs> we all have an evangelist stage uh, and a fanatical stage, I think. And although I let go of that evangelist stage under Tom's guidance, you know, of wanting to try to preach it to everyone and responding to people's interest. Uh, you know, and I became a teacher in 2005, you know, after being around Tom for 15 years. And, you know, I became a teacher and, of course, I, I love what I do. But I did used to have quietly inside, never expressed, a kind of, I'd call it a judgment, a gap, especially as apps came online and, you know, mindfulness has, has got lots of, uh, uh, you know, more, more public interest and stuff like that. I was a little bit inside. Uh, I guess I could say superior, but, you know, I, I just thought, yeah, but this stuff works, you know, it's really easy, it works. Mindfulness, I see as a consequence of meditation, not the practice, uh, you know, to get it. Um, and so, but the last few years I, I've loosened up and I'm sure it's true for you, 
you know, you've taught, initiated people into Vedic meditation now who started off on an app of some kind. And I've met quite a few now and, and they were quite devoted. You know, they did it for a couple of years or more regularly, once a day or sometimes twice a day using the app. And I think one has to respect that, mm -hmm. that, that the apps give something. And it's been good for me to experience that and speak to people about that and get that feedback because it's made me less judgmental about them, you know. And so long answer to your question that, you know, I, I think all of, you know, ev everything's useful, you know. Anything that turns someone inward and gives them a little... Uh, a little relief from the relentless ambitions of the mind um, is worthwhile. That, that, that's absolutely for sure. That's absolutely for sure. And, and it's really lovely that spontaneously people do from beginnings like that, from apps and mindfulness, go, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> You know, there's this wonderful little lacking or this query for many of them that keep them searching and somehow or other, you know, they end up on our doorstep. Yeah. So when you first learned, um, were you actively looking for something or, or did, you, did you come across this? Or what was the... Well, look, I first heard about TM... Curiously enough, about 11 kilometres from where I'm living uh, right now in a place called Point Leo. And uh, a friend of mine there, we we're in his split windscreen combi van. <laughs> For those who are uh, history knows those, you know, it's a surf spot. I was ne never a surfer. I was always, you know, the hippie on the beach. And... Um, you know, we were sitting in his van and he said, oh, I, I just, I just learned this meditation. I said, really, what's it like? He said, it's a bit like getting stoned. I said, what's the address? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, that's a true story. Uh, but, um, I have to, I'd like to say that I think my motivations were deeper than just that. <laughs> and even through my teenage years, I'd had an inquiry. In our family, we lost our mother. I was just 10 years old when we lost our mother to disease. And our father, a remarkable man, brought us up. He had three teenage boys and a two-year-old daughter when mother passed away. he just transitioned from being an, a major in the army to being a school teacher and it was the 1960s, you know. <laughs> uh, he had a lot of adaptation uh, demands, you know, made upon him and he responded in an extraordinary way from a strict military background to being an incredibly leading open teacher uh, who really uh, led ways of education that are only just being kind of put into schools now, being experientially based. Uh, but so he encouraged all of our interests, but uh, it's certainly the losing of our mother invoked an inquiry, at least in two of us, two of the four siblings. And my eldest brother joined the Hare Krishnas uh, after about three, year, three, or, three or four years of searching after our mother died. It really, he remembers clearly the priest coming to console us and failing. <laughs> failing to uh, explain why such a thing could happen and, you know, where, where is mother now and all of that sort of thing. And that immediately inspired his spiritual search. And I was just 10, but he was my hero brother, uh, the eldest one, and that certainly influenced my own search. So even through my teenage years, I was reading things like, I don't know if you... Anyone remembers them, Lob Sang Rampa, um, a whole series of, apparently it was written by an Irish plumber 
in Dublin, <laughs> but it was portrayed <laughs> a, as being a, uh, a monk who came out of Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the Irish plumber truth or not, but the first three or four books of it actually were a really interesting insight into Eastern spirituality and it made a big difference, a big inspiration to me. So uh, it was more than just uh, that that meditation got you stoned. I was, I was certainly had and part of me was looking to find some meaning uh, in the unexpected things that life gives us. Yeah. It's interesting when you talk about um, getting stoned because I learned in 1970 and uh, my parents didn't know that I, I had learned. Yeah. So I, wrote, I rang them up and told them. And my father wrote a letter to the headmaster saying, um, does this mean that Anthony will start taking up smoking marijuana? <laughs> 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 he won't Little have did he know. <laughs> <laughs> but there was this, there's the, there was this kind of assumption that it was kind of way out there, that it was all hippy trippy, and the landscape I think at that time, you know, was so so different. I mean, obviously the Beatles and and Jagger and the Beach Boys and you know all sorts of influential rock stars and people in the public eye, you know, were getting into it. But they were kind of fun loving after all it was you know the summer of love um yeah. you know and, and it was a very different kind of atmosphere and i think you know it took a while for that to be sort of shaken off that you know this is not something that you kind of just bliss you know you kind of trip yeah. out on that it is something much more fundamental and i think it, it took a, it took a little while for for that to kind of percolate through I, and I, I think that's one of the reasons why Maharishi was so, in the 60s, was so insistent that all of his initiators wear suits and, uh, you know, uh, all of this sort of stuff uh, that he insisted upon and, and has now become, you know, a 1960s, 1970s suit has now become the Asram attire. <laughs> of the TM movement, you know, <laughs> and I can imagine hundreds of years' time, uh, you know, there being these little secret kind of TM places because, you know, Maharishi's stated ambition that I think is the most extraordinary ambition that any being's ever had on earth is that he said he wanted this knowledge to last 10,000 years. That was his stated aim. 10,000 years, I mean, even Alexander the Great just hoped that his grandson had an empire, you know. And Maharishi, you know, so I, I, I just have this fantasy of 500 years' time, these little secret meetings and people pull out these 1970-looking suits <laughs> <laughs> to, to meditate together. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> You did um, say we were allowed to be distracted, Anthony. So, yes, <laughs> of course, you know, it's free flow. So, free when flow. did you get into Ayurveda, Tim? I'm fascinated to hear hear about that that aspect of your knowledge and, and your experience. Right. So that you know that was in uh, 89, 90, when you know Deepak Chopra was under the uh, umbrella of uh, Maharishi at that time, and he was touring the world, really enlivening. The knowledge of Ayurveda, although he'd never at that stage he'd never trained in it himself. He wasn't his Deepak's not an Ayurvedic doctor. He's a, a medical doctor, but you know he spent a long time with Maharishi under his guidance and with all the Vajas. So anyway, he was touring the world uh, promoting Ayurveda, and he came to Sydney, and uh, I met him, had my pulse taken by him, and. Uh, you know, various other sort of uh, things that he taught. And Tom was really uh, speaking so highly of him. And, and he was fantastic, you know. I, it was great. So, and Tom really encouraged me as our kind of relationship uh, developed because we both had a, Tom and I had a love of the sea. And so it, it, we, we had a connection. And I would sail on the sea and he, would, he used to surf around the edges, you know. 
Uh, so we, we, we developed a friendship as well as a, uh, a uh, you know, student teacher uh, relationship. Um, and he really encouraged me because I, I loved cooking. I already had a great love of cooking. Again, as a result of our mother dying, you know, and father was a lousy cook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if people ask me why I turned v v vegetarian, it was because of my father's chops. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I and but my father used to make all three boys cook as part of you know, a meal a week as part of running the household. You know, he remained single until my sister grew up and he remarried and had 27 blissful years uh, at the end of his life in relationship and marriage. But so all the boys learned to cook really well. Um, so I had that and Tom just said, you should get, get into this Ayurveda. And so, and yeah, the TM movement was really promoting it under Deepak's sort of guidance and uh, there was a centre there at Manly uh, that they just bought. And so I, I got involved in that. I was a house painter. It was my funding mechanism transitioning into boat painter. And so I painted that uh, new centre in Manly. Uh, and, you know, I just attended all of the courses that were going. And it just, I Ayurveda just, as so many people now say to me, as a teacher of Ayurveda, just go, just makes sense you know you know it's not intellectual i mean there is there's an intellect in there it just it resonates with your experience and that's what i found and so uh so i ran my first ayurvedic cooking class about with uh dr sean matthews a medical doctor in sydney uh, who practices uses ayurveda in his practice and we met at a pulse diagnosis, self pulse diagnosis course run by the TM Centre. And uh, at that stage, he'd run one Ayurvedic cooking class himself, and I'd run one Ayurvedic cooking class. And so at the lunchtime of this seminar, we discovered that and we both went, oh my God, it's so much work, you know, <laughs> you know sort of being on stage for eight hours. It's, it's incredibly demanding. Uh, and so one of us said, well, why don't we run one together? Which, so he did, and that became an 18-year tradition. Uh, you know, Two Skinny Blokes was the sort of subtitle of our course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in contrast to that show, Two Fat Women, that was popular in that, <laughs> around that time. And, uh, and so we ran them in Sydney, you know, for 18 years uh, together. So through that time, that impulse of Deepak Chopra, and again with Tom's uh, support, I just started studying. You know, any any teacher that turned up, uh, I studied, and and I, and I continue uh, to do that. I I actually got a diploma as an Ayurvedic consultant a few years ago, but I've kind of studied it with uh, many different teachers. Uh, part of my good luck is. I seem to meet people. I, I seem to meet, you know, the, the uh, big, big teachers and stuff in some way, you know. So, you know, I've studied with and met Vasant Vlad and Deepak Chopra and uh, Robert Svoboda uh, and, you know, many. Hart de Foe, you know, I studied Jyotish palm, Vedic palmistry with Hart de Foe in the 90s. And there was a centre in Sydney uh, during the 90s that Sean and uh, Swami, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now. Uh, anyway, so just whenever there was Ayurveda, I, I studied it and I've been to India a few times. My main inspiration is a man called Dr. Uh, Sunil Joshi. He's written a great book called Ayurveda and Panchakarma. And it's a book that I think gives the first half of it gives the best summary, undiluted summary of Ayurveda. And so if you've got interest in Ayurveda, Rory, I really recommend, uh, you know, chasing that book up. And the second half's all about the treatments of Panchakarma. That's of some interest. But the, the first half 
laying it out is really clear, precise, and pure in its presentation. You know? and, and for maybe our audience members who don't know anything about Ayurveda, how, how would you summarize that summary? <laughs> um, how many words am I allowed? Five hundred. Thousand. Five thousand. Ayurveda is wisdom in living. Ayu means life or lifespan. Aveda means wisdom. The Ayurveda is the science that comes from the Veda, this vast uh, body of knowledge, the most ancient record of human experience on the planet. Uh, uh, it's, Ayurveda is lifespan, so it's concerned about what the moment of conception to the moment of death. Uh, and Very it succinct. leaves what happens before <laughs> and after to other sciences. You know, that's enough, I think. You know, that'll... Mm. <laughs> Beautiful. Perfect. That, that, that's been trying to keep you busy. It's, it's a real understanding of how to align ourselves with the impulses of intelligence that create the universe, uh, the impulse of intelligence of nature. Why Ayurveda is so satisfying if, if it's presented well uh, and if we understand it well is we recognize the truth in it because it's in our experience. And it's not like some things which we study, which is kind of like, oh, that's a really interesting concept. <laughs> and we strain to pull this concept into our mind, you know, so that we can look out through that kind of those lenses. Uh, Ayurveda, you know, when it's approached, uh, properly is many people just go, oh, yeah, that's right. My grand I, I call it the wisdom of every grandmother on the planet. So it comes from India. You know, what, what India's great wisdom or insight was, was they systematised knowledge that is intrinsic to life. And so it's my experience, you know, I've met grandmothers in the middle of the Czech Republic, you know, and I've spoken about a few things like making a, a saffron tonic, a rasayana, you know, and you know, I've always said you should boil the milk three times. And this grandmother said, my grandmother told me that. Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, just, just beautiful stuff. It, Ayurveda doesn't present concepts. It, it presents an experience and say, how does this fit? How does this fit with your experience, you know? Yeah, that was what when I read Deepak's um, Perfect Health book, I had lots of those aha moments, you know, where you have the, you know, my Vata constitution doesn't like salad. And I was like, great, I never liked salad. I much prefer, <laughs> you know, warm stews and I've never liked cold water. And it, I love how you explain it like that, that it has these, you know, this this common understanding of things you already know, but it kind of gives you permission to to follow those those inner um, inclinations, which makes it such a um, easy thing to follow because you already want to follow follow its advice. It's real uh, verification and, and validation. Which is like a sort what, of, sorry, sorry, Timbo, carry on. No, I'm just going to say, which is what all scripture should be. Scripture, you know, if we understand scripture being, you know, an ancient wisdom or ancient record of human experience, is my chosen description. And scripture should be there not to teach us something, but to verify and validate something that we're experiencing. That's so great. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I interrupted you, Anthony. No, no, no. no you, you, know. You just mentioned being in, in Czechoslovakia and... Um, Czech Republic. Czech Republic, excuse me. I haven't been to Czechoslovakia for a very, very long time. <laughs> <laughs> that on behalf of half of my thousands of students there. I've got to pull you up on that, sorry. <laughs> I'm an old-fashioned sort of a guy, you know. Czech, Czech Republic. Still in the Czech 70s. Republic. 
Um, so you, <coughs> you, you were teaching there for for quite a while, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, so seven years. Yeah, seven years. And um, I, I still teach there. I've just I've just finished a uh, running a online Ayurvedic cleanse. Uh, whole mung cleanse there, a, a 10 day cleanse there, uh, you know, via Zoom. G G God bless, you know, the goddess of Zoom. And uh, <laughs> you know, I had, um, you know, 50, had 50 people, you know, uh, attending that. And I have group meditations there uh, once a month, uh, also via Zoom now with the woman that I trained to be an initiator, uh, who's I've kind of left there to keep the you know the consciousness going so and am i right in thinking you also worked in latvia and other east european states yeah I, I taught in i was based in czech republic but i've taught in estonia uh, in finland in sweden in spain and in switzerland and in france yeah <laughs> so and very interestingly, one of the few in our, you know, growing community is, you know, I spent, you know, nearly 10 years, towards 10 years in Czech Republic, I learned 10 words, including ahoy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm a, I'm a terrible linguist. So I actually taught in a foreign language through a translator. And, you know, I, I think I could say I'm probably the more experienced person in the world doing that. And if any initiator ever comes across that situation, then, uh, you know, I, I'm the boy to speak to, to be sure. So that's, and that's a very curious experience to actually teach through a translator. Uh, it was very good for me because I tend to, you know, ramble on which you can't do with a translator. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it was a great discipline to learn to be precise. And, uh, but I, I just share the experience of initiating the very first person in Czech Republic when I went there in 2009. And I'd been invited there by a Czech woman, who's Teresa, uh, who I trained. Uh, you know, she, she learned here in Sydney uh, when she met me there and then uh, returned home and she was a yoga teacher doing yoga teacher training in Sydney and she returned home and like myself just went, when I go to other meditation things, it's like I've gone to kindergarten compared to what I'm experiencing and my understanding that I've got through you. You've got to come here. My country needs you, you know. So she organised it, you know. I'm very obedient when given clear instructions. <laughs> <laughs> and was she and, your translator? Um, hey? So was she, she was your... my translator, yeah. Okay. She spoke really excellent English. She'd been meditating for a, at least a year or so, which is really important if you're, if you're working with a translator, they must be a meditator. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, yeah. I, I, tried, I, I did it once without a, tra you know, where the translator was doing the course but i only ever did that once so it, it, <laughs> it did not work i mean you know we, we got through it and people got the experience but it was very rough very very rough but i just want to share as uh, as your initiators and just for the audience the bigger audience is that first person who i initiated i spoke to tom about it and he gave me guidelines on on what to do with a translator, you know, in, in that regard. And anyway, when I went in, we went in and said, you know, slowly open your eyes, you know, that beautiful, intimate moment that you have with people as a initiator of uh, Vedic meditation, you know, from their first meditation. And, you know, this girl opened her eyes with that kind of wide eyed, kind of wonder because something happened something absolutely happened and you know um i just went wow this stuff really works like we shared no common language no word at all common 
between this person and, and that person. And yet by following the procedure of my training as a Vedic meditation teacher, following all of that, there it was, you know, and I just went, this is truly magnificent, you know, in the highest meaning of, of that word, you know, this transcends culture and language and everything. And although I'd been meditating for decades and a teacher for uh, about five, five years at that stage, it just kind of, you know, Jay Gurudev, as we say, it was, I was so humbled by that experience. It's a beautiful story. Such a great story. But Timbo also, I mean, you're a very humble man, but it would have also been something about yes, I am, you. aren't I? Yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you're when yeah. you're, I, I would imagine that when you're in a situation where you're giving an introductory talk, uh, or giving a talk, and you have a have a translator, the audience is spending quite a lot of time scrutinising you. You know, they they, they can scrutinise they can scrutinise you when you're talking, and they can also scrutinise you whilst you're listening to the translator give give the interpretation. Yeah. And you know, it, your personality and your demeanour, that calmness, that centeredness, would also have had some influence on that audience. Oh, certainly. You know, we are as as Tom says in his. Uh, in this re his recently promoted uh, The Power of Speech, such a good course. If, if you didn't attend it, then when it comes up again, I encourage it, you and any of your students to do it. One of the more practical things, but he's quoting uh, McCallum McCusker saying, the medium is the message. You know, you are the message. You know, as, as much as what you deliver, you are the message, especially in what we teach as a Vedic. You know, I think that's true of all of us, Anthony, but it's a really good point you say that I'd never thought about in the decades I've been doing it, that they do, they get that extra scrutiny, whereas when you're speaking to a, uh, in English, then they're just kind of listening to the words. I mean, it is all happening, but they really get that chance to just look at you going, because they can't understand it, and then, <laughs> and then... And then, then they hear the information. So, so I'm a little bit curious after hearing all of your amazing experiences and traveling and the awareness that you must have gained through years of meditation, Ayurveda and practicing. For those people in our audience who might not have started a practice yet and are struggling a little bit, either because of the pandemic or other things. In your opinion, what would you say is kind of the point of all of this? The, the all the experience that you're having. Well, each of us are on the planet. We we have this body and this mind, and we have a life. But some of us are going, and like us, have discovered the beauties that our practice gives us for but though for those who might be struggling a little bit or maybe thinking about meditating or getting into ayurveda what would you say is the point <laughs> of, of life of having of being inhabited in this body look there's a um there's a restaurant in prague in the czech republic uh I can't remember the Czech name, of course, but it translates as clear head. It's a vegetarian restaurant. If ever, it's an incredible restaurant, beautiful decor and all of this sort of stuff. But when Teresa took me there the very first time, uh, we had this little booth. It's an amazing place. Um, and it says on the menu, on the front page of their menu, uh, Priests, monks, and the enlightened uh, eat in this restaurant for free. And I went, oh, that's sweet. Yeah, nice. You know, uh, you know, and because uh, they've they kind of got kind of Buddhist kind of support background. And anyway, so we, we had our meal and just Teresa and I and you know, a bit of interaction with the waiters and all of that. And uh, anyway, you know, we, we came to leave and. Uh, you know, I was, I was going to pay you know, for the both of us. And uh, 
Teresa said, I oh, listen to the way he says, listen, I, I think Tim should eat for free. <laughs> and I said, oh, look, it, it doesn't matter, you know, like, you know, it's cool, I, I don't mind to pay, you know. And she said, no, no, it says it on the menu. Uh, <laughs> it says it here. Uh, therefore, I, I think he sh- should eat for free. He fulfills. And, of course, you know, I'm dressed like this. And he's kind of looking at me going, you're not a monk. You know, <laughs> I, I didn't even have all of this. This is the COVID beard, my first. <laughs> um, so, you know, he kind of, and he said, but, you know, and Trey said, well, look, you know, he's come all the way from Australia, you know, to our country, and he, he's come here to enlighten this country. And uh, he says, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he's enlightened. He's enlightened. He's more enlightened than me. Uh, and he's come here to serve our country, you know, and on the point of principle, if this is on your menu, she worked in a law firm, you know, I think he should eat for free. (laughs) And he goes, all right, and so he goes off and we kind of look over to the coffee machine and there's a little huddle there with a few kind of... (laughs) (laughs) ..looking over and and he comes back and he says... Well, he says, well, look, you know, if you're enlightened, can you answer a question? I said, yes, of course. I'm a teacher. I love questions. He said, he said well, really stupid question in my um, opinion, with all respect, Derek. But <laughs> he, <laughs> he, said, he said, what's the meaning of life? And this was 2009 and there'd just been a tsunami in Japan that had killed 100,000 people two days before, right? 100,000 people were gone overnight, you know. And I looked at him, you know, meaningfully and leaned closer a, a little bit to him and I said, there is no meaning. He kind of went, oh, he looked a little bit unshaky, you know, like I'd pulled the rug out from under him and I said, you know, two days ago, 100,000 people got killed by a wave. You know, where, where's the meaning in that, you know? Even the highest kind of arguments of karmic, you know, karma intellectualism can't explain how 100,000 people, you know, deserve to get drowned by a wave. Right? So he's looking really shaky. I said, you know... If we look for a meaning in life, we'll go crazy, to be sure. You know, life's not about a meaning. Life is an experience. You know, we're just here for one thing, you know. It, it to, luckily, that wasn't quite your question. You were kind of asking what the purpose of it was, so I felt, <laughs> which is slightly yeah. different from meaning, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I said, so, you know, we're, we're just here to experience. You know, that, that's, that's what the meaning is. And he kind of looked at me and, you know, went back to the coffee machine. There was another little huddle and a few more <laughs> people looking over the coffee machine. And I, I ate for free. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the question was obviously um, satisfying. <laughs> Uh, you know, the answer was satisfying to them, but, um, uh, you know, so, you know, what's the purpose in life? It's kind of the same answer, you know, and I think that's what, you know, the the elevator answer, you know, the trip in the, the elevator, uh, the, the answer would be, you know, we're here to experience. You know, that is what we're here for. You know, we're... we're we're an experiencing machine, you know. You know, we've, we've got the high, most highly refined and developed nervous system in the neighbourhood that we know about uh, for one purpose, and that's to experience. And if we are experiencing, we're fulfilling the purpose in life. Or let, let, let me say we're fulfilling the purpose of life. Life with a capital L, which means 
uh, that if you're alive and are choosing to continue to be, then we are fulfilling life's purpose by the experience, whether that experience is good or bad. Uh, you know, bad being I'm not enjoying it, good being I am enjoying it, you know, to define those words of good and bad. Bad just means I'm not enjoying it. <laughs> um, which means we can't really, you know, there's no mistake that can be made except to throw away the ability to experience, which is to, which is to dispose of the machine that gives the ability which, which has happened recently. A really dear friend of mine that our community owes such gratitude to, Will Dalton, you know, took his own life in Bali recently. Uh, it's a whole other story and very, very sad, but that he ended up in a state that he made that mistake, that he threw away the ability, the machine that gives us the ability of change of our experience, because the experience is the core of the purpose of life, life searching for experience through nervous systems. And it's beautiful. I th and thank you for sharing that perspective of it as well. And I think just to underscore or highlight that, because even for myself, I was like coming to this episode, I was like, yeah, what it, what's life's purpose? And I don't believe that it's one thing or another. It's both and, but largely, again, to experience, but also that, I guess, for people who are listening to this, I think we get caught up in having a preferred experience over another. Because I think we all would say we have students who come, especially when they're learning to meditate and, and when they close their eyes and settle, they might have a very profound experience, and then they think that this is what they're supposed to be having, a particular experience. And I think it's important just to let people know too, because whether people are feeling anxious or depressed or whatever it might be, that the beauty is that you have the ability to have that experience as well, whether it's joyous and blissful or it's not that either, because I think we get hung up in oh, I'm having a certain experience and that's not what life's about. I need to change it. I'm supposed to be having a different one where for me at least, I, I recognize it's about having the ability of having every experience possible. I'm, I'm trying to, to experience as much as I possibly can. And that's what, it, that's what it's kind of revealed to me. Very good. You know, I've had one... I've had many little and continuous realizations, but I can say in my life, I've had one real revelation, you know, apart from when I'm teaching and someone asks a question, then as you all experience, I know as initiators, you're as interested as anyone else in the room. And I've had many revelations in response to a question made of me, but I've had this one real spiritual revelation, if we want to call it that. And I was very young. I was 21 years old. Uh, I was in Madagascar. Um, and you know, I'd, I'd sailed across the Indian Ocean. I spent a year and a half, you know, living in the islands of the Indian Ocean. And I ended up in Madagascar. It's right down on the West Coast on the Mozambique Channel with another Australian friend, and we were trying to decide whether to buy an outrigger canoe and sail it up and down the Mozambique Channel. We had no experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'd been on yachts, but I was, at that stage, it was my introduction to it, and I was just the tail end on the rope, you know. I pulled when I was told to pull. Uh, that was my experience. So here we are, and we we're really confused about whether to buy this outrig a canoe with a, two poles and a, you know, a sheet for a sail, you know. Um, and we just couldn't decide whether we should do it or not. It was $30 after all, you know, and we were travelling, you know, we didn't want to spend money unnecessarily. <laughs> I knew $30 was a lot more then. 
anyway, I was really confused, like Arjuna, you know, on, on the battlefield uh, with Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. And, you know, I was really overwhelmed about what to do. And I was in this outside shower in this tiny little tin shed hotel uh, that we were staying in. It was just a tin shed coal shower. And, you know, I don't know if you've read any of the Vedic mythological stories, but there's often expressions where something was happening and it says, and then a voice from the sky said. <laughs> Have you read that? It appears often, you know, the and it doesn't say God said. It doesn't say the voice was God or anything. It always just says, and a voice from the sky said, and it modified the person's behaviour. And... Anyway, I had this experience. I was in this cold shower in this little tin shed on the west coast of Madagascar on the Mozambique Channel, really confused, and all of a sudden the voice from the sky <laughs> said, it does, no, said nothing matters. And it was just, it was as clear as a bell. It was, I can still remember it, say, decades ago, it was omni Present. It didn't come from there or there or there or there. It was just, I couldn't even say it came from inside. It was definitely, it felt like an external experience. Nothing matters. And all of the strain, all of the stress completely left my system and it left an inner understanding. This is the important thing. This inner understanding was, therefore, everything you do is important. Because if nothing matters, where does mattering come from? It comes from me. You know, not because the Veda said it, because father said it, mother said it, teacher said it, lover said it, policeman said it, whatever. If nothing matters, what matters comes from me. Everything's important. So it was an incredible experience. And, and you know, the... I remember I was, I was like I was in a golden light afterwards, you know. I was every single bit of stress left to physiology and I was left with realising every single thing that I did mattered if I chose it to, to matter. I chose what mattered. There was no right or wrong, you know. And so I, I, I went into David and said, let's go buy that outreach. <laughs> Which we did, and that's a really long another story. <laughs> <laughs> One I haven't told in a long time, I have to say, but um, um, it was an amazing thing, and that's kind of stayed with me. Of course, I've forgotten it, and I remember it, but that that quality is, Derek, I think is what we're both saying, is that mattering is ours to choose. And if someone's feeling stressed, you know, and they haven't learned to meditate, or if we can still feel stressed after we've learned to meditate, we should be clear about that too. It's not a panacea. Um, it's the, I say, meditation is the oil of change. It oils the wheel of change. It doesn't create the change. We still have to choose the direction we want the wheel to go in. We've got to make the effort. Um, but that's mattering comes from us. And so if, like reiterating what you say, if we're experiencing, we're feeling life's purpose. And so now, you know, if I'm feeling anxiety, it's because I think something matters and it doesn't, nothing matters. All anxiety comes from the illusion that something matters. What matters is what I want to do. <laughs> and but it's my mattering <laughs> no i mean i i think another way of looking at it from just purely from my perspective is that not only am i here to experience but i am the creator of the experience and even more than that i create what the experience means and that's why now as an initiator and as a teacher i can have an experience that was similar to one I had 20 years ago, but feel completely differently about it and maybe invite it when it was something before I didn't want at all. But because I know I'm creating 
the experience and either it's going to be lasting for a, a very brief period or it's going to stay around for a while again it's just another experience you know whether i'm i'm calling it in i'm wanting it or whatever i i'm having experience so i mean i'm the creator i i get to experience and i and then i get to choose what it all means you know it's beautiful i'm reminded of a of a, a story concerning marishi who was at a very long event um he was sitting there as the guest of honor for for many many hours and at the end somebody came up to him and said marishi did you enjoy enjoy that and he said i enjoyed myself very much <laughs> <laughs> how wonderful these sages have got the ability to answer a question on all levels at once I'm sure you enjoyed Tim's zest for life and hearing his thoughts on a range of topics. When talking about Ayurveda, I liked his reference to the wisdom of every grandmother on the planet. We ignore the common sense and insights of that generation at our cost. Tim made several other important points. When the mind is quietened and we're having an experience in consciousness, we can take what life has to offer and experience everything at its fullest. Living in present moment awareness gives us a deep and rich experience. He also spoke about how meditation is not a panacea for stress. It's the oil for wheels of change, and we have to decide the direction of the wheel. We've talked about change in the past episodes, and right now we're experiencing it a great deal. We may not be able to go out as much as before, but now we have the opportunity through meditation to turn our attention inwards where we can experience more space within. If this conversation reminds you of similar issues or occasions, we'd love to hear about them and have you join the conversation. Please send them through to us at stories at thevedicconversation.com or post them on social media with the hashtag thevedicconversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your followers and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you next time.